Hello everyone and welcome to EK Workshop which is about inspection, testing and commissioning of electrical switchboards, circuit breakers, protective relays, cables and PLCs. My name is Beruz and in here I'm just going to present topic one of this workshop which is about fundamentals of switch gears. In particular, we are going to talk about single line diagram, typical construction of LV, MV and HV switch gears, active and passive network components, circuit breaker utilization, fuse switches, HV fuses in combination with circuit breakers and auto recloses and auto reclose operations. So let's talk about single line diagram at the beginning. You know that the that the, um, the power circuits that we analyze every day, that we work with every day, they are three phase systems, inclusive of phases A and B and C. So normally the voltages that we are considering, they are three phase voltages. Powers that we are considering, normally they are three phase powers. The system currents that we are working with, they are currents on phases A and B and C. So it's very natural that we have got three phase circuit diagrams. Unfortunately, when the circuit becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, studying such systems on three phase diagrams would be a very difficult to task, a difficult task, okay? And well, the reader could be a little bit confused because you are considering all three phases at the same time. This may not be a good practice on some occasions. So as a result of that, we would prefer to show only one of the phases, which in many cases is, is phase A, which is the reference phase, which represents the rest of the system. Well, we can do that as long as we have got a balanced power system. It means that the loading on the three phases are almost equal. Almost same current, same system voltage, and system angle of power for the three phases. If we, if we have got this, that would be much more convenient if we show the whole circuit just by one of the phases, which we call the single line diagram or SLD, and this one in here is an example of that. So you can see that the whole circuit has been shown by means of single line diagram, and you can study what is happening between points a and C. So this is just for phase A, say, and if you want to know what, what is happening for phase B, all you need to do is just to consider 120 degrees phase shift between the components of the system, like current or voltage. If you want to know what's happening with phase C, well, another 120 degrees phase shift. So same magnitude or amplitude, but the phases would be different. So when you are modeling and analyzing such a system by means of a software package, all you need to do is just to present and introduce the system circuit diagram, single line diagram, on phase A to the software, and the software itself would be able to demonstrate the other two phases once it's got the information on phase A. All right, so as you can see in here, on a single line diagram of a power system, power network, we have got a number of important components like circuit breakers, bus bars, current transformers, voltage transformers, power transformers, distribution transformers, okay? So let's talk about the circuit breakers. Well, they have got many different types. Historically, basically, they started to be oil circuit breaker. And then 
the technology was more advanced and air blast circuit breakers were manufactured. And then again, more advancement into the technology of circuit breakers, vacuum circuit breakers were produced. And after that, finally, SF6 circuit breakers. But what is the difference? So what is the function of a circuit breaker to switch on and off while the system is live? under load, loading situation and also under fault situation. So what is the result of that? The result of that is when you are making a switching like this, there will be a big arc and that arc has to be put out, has to be quenched. Other than that, there will be damages to the equipment, there will be damages to the public, people, personnel, so this arc has to be controlled. To do that, we need to have an insulation medium, something that can quench that arc. So historically, it started with oil. So what happened with, was that we just put the switching part of that circuit breaker submerged in oil. So that as soon as the switching operates and that arc is going to be produced, the oil around it just prevents it. So that's one method of doing that. Another one is air blast. So it means that you have got a strong blow of air onto that arc or fire, say just to put it out. So you need obviously to have a pump, compressor or something like that and you have to produce very strong blow of air so that it can put it out. Another one is vacuum circuit breaker. So any fire needs to have air to exist. Is that right? So if you just place that switching part of the circuit breaker in a chamber where there is no air, in that case, the arc normally would not be able to be produced. And finally, that was the advent of a very useful gas called SF6, which has got very, very high dielectric strength. And if the switching happens in that area, we can make sure that the system is safe, even the minimum clearance distances can be reduced a lot. It means that you can place the live parts much closer to each other and therefore you can save a lot of space. So as I said, when you think about oil circuit breaker, this is the very, very early technology, okay? So bulk oil. As you can see, we have got the two contacts of the circuit breaker in here, but what happens is that they have been submerged in oil. So we have got oil in here and we have got the contacts of the circuit breaker as you can see in here and as soon as the circuit breaker operates, what happens is that this arc uh, will have to be established under the oil and that oil will prevent that. So what's the problem with this? While these kind of circuit breakers have already been phased out because of a number of um, reasons. First of all, you need to have, especially for uh, HV circuit breakers, 132 kV, 66 kV, you need to have large volume of oil. That makes this circuit breaker very heavy and very bulky. And worse than that is that this oil which we call the PCV, when you are using it, it, if it is released, if you have got a leakage or you have got, I don't know, a fault or something like that, this oil can be very, very dangerous and it is poisonous and it brings about heavy pollution. So the next technology after this was to make it minimum oil circuit breaker. So they said, why at all should we put all the mechanism of the circuit breaker submerged in oil? 
So the idea was to reduce the amount of oil used in the circuit breaker. So they invented the technology of minimum oil circuit breaker. Again, this is already phased out. But what happens, and, and again, oil is the insulation medium. But they have put just the two contacts in the oil and not the rest of the mechanism. And therefore, they have saved a lot of space. They have saved a lot of, uh, let's say, weight or something like that. So it is smaller. It is lighter. It occupies less space. But again, it's been phased out because um, other technologies came in, like this air blast circuit breaker. Even this one has been already phased out. So, as you can see in here, what happens is that the switching parts, the contact part of the circuit breaker have been placed in an area where you can blow a strong air into that. As a result of that, you need to have an air tank and you need to have a valve, blast valve, and therefore you need to have a compressor so that you can puff a strong wind of air onto the arc. Well, in terms of the operation, these air blast circuit breakers, they are much better than the oil ones. So they need compressed air, but the problem with, is with that compressed air. Because of what? Well, because these circuit breakers are making a lot of noise. Even if you use, let's say, silences. That can bother the personnel, that can bother the neighbors around the substation or something. So basically, again, scientists thought about inventing much better technology than this. So they thought about vacuum interrupters. So as you can see in here, this line, the switching component of the circuit breaker has been placed inside a cartridge, inside a chamber, where you have got only vacuum. Therefore, the fire, the arc, will not find the opportunity to be created at all. So, this is very good, especially if you have got dust and pollution as well in the area. And this technology is still in use and very successfully. So, this is very good in terms of the time it takes actually to quench the arc. It is good. In terms of the efficiency of the system, it is good. Now, what happened was that the next technology was SF6. And now, especially these days, they use this SF6 in combination with that vacuum interrupter. So as you can see in here, you have got a switch gear. You have got a metallic frame. You have got an enclosure. So in terms of the switching part of the circuit breaker, they are enclosed in the vacuum, uh, let's say, cartridge. And in terms of the rest of the area, they have, it's been filled with SF6 so that the metallic frame is secure from the live parts of the circuit breaker. So, what is SF6? Well, SF6 is a gas, of course, and it has got its own physical and chemical characteristics and features. It has got a very, very high dielectric strength, and as a result of that, it allows live components of the switch here to sit very close to each other because it replaces the air. However, there is a condition for good use and operation of these SF6 circuit breakers, and that is all this high dielectric strength of the gas or something is guaranteed as long as this SF6 is still pure, it has not been affected by impurities and also the pressure of the gas is maintained at a constant level. As a result of that, we have to constantly monitor the pressure of the gas. We have to constantly and periodically monitor and check and test the purity of gas. 
Other than that, it will lose its very high and good, um, let's say, this um, uh, dielectric strength. And therefore, it will no longer be a good insulation material. So therefore, we can classify all the components of a power system into active and passive while we are doing this course. We can refer to active components which are always in, in service. They are constantly being used like transformers, cables, overhead lines, metering equipment, and all the time they are being used. But we have got some equipment that we call them passive. Yes, they are there, but they may not be in use at all the time, like these circuit breakers. They are used whenever a switching is required, like the protection relays. Yes, they are there, but they are not uh, constantly in operation. They they operate when there is a fault in the system. Earth switches, they operate whenever you want to make an earthing connection. Not at all the time using them, them or disconnect switches or isolator switches. So in order to have a very good utilization of a circuit breaker, there are some standards, there are some uh, practical procedures so that the functionality of the circuit breakers are well maintained and guaranteed. So therefore, there are two important moments related to the utilization and operation of circuit breakers. One of them is the time when you are closing the circuit breaker and another one is the time when you are opening the circuit breaker. Under the load, under the fault, so what happens is that you have got a current that goes into the relay, uh, into the circuit breaker at the time of close and another one at the time of open. So this is what we call as make and break. So we have got a make fault current and we have got a break fault current. So we need to be able to study the behavior of such currents so that we can introduce the protection part of these circuit breakers. And the system mustn't be affected by this kind of make and break currents. These currents, these fault currents, have to be limited perfectly well. Well, another switching device, as you know, is the fuse. But we have got uh, a combination of fused and switching equipment. So fuse by itself is an independent device. It is a protection device and a switching device. However, you can put it in a compartment like this with the stand and brackets and insulation and many different things, especially for HV fuses. So that they are not just in the open air and they are safe and people cannot touch the live part inside, but that switching device, rather than having a circuit breaker, for whatever type it is, it is a fuse. It's a HV fuse. But in combination to that, you can add, for example, air switch. You can add cable box or something like that, as you can see in here. So it's got a tripping mechanism. And that tripping mechanism is based on the switch, on the fuse operation. So while the main core of this equipment is the fuse, but it has got its switching component as well. So it says if fuse switches are used to feed a transformer, all three phases must be disconnected when a single phase fault trips the circuit breaker. So that's a must, for not, not just for this, but for all of them. All kinds of circuit breakers or something like that. So you have got a switching device on phase A and one on phase B and one on phase C. That's a three phase system, isn't it, right? So even if you have got a fault on phase B, for example, it will not be okay if just phase B is disconnected and phases A and C are working. That would not be good because you, ha you will have over voltage, excessive over voltage on the other two phases. And the system 
will be automatically shut down. So it, it is your duty actually to make sure that even upon having a fault on one of the phases, all three phases are disconnected and cut off at the same time. So it says HG fuses in combination with and as alternative to circuit breakers. Well, of course, they are cheaper. If you are able to use HV fuses instead of circuit breakers, that'll be much better if you can. Well, circuit breakers can be equipped with protection or something like that, but these fuses by itself they are protection. So you would not be required to install any um, additional protection on onto that. But circuit breaker is just a switching device. It does need to have protection. Good news is that these fuses, in terms of their protection feature, they are very fast. But there are disadvantages. Every time a circuit breaker operates, it can easily again close, open something. But this is not the case with fuses. Once they are operating, they are blown. So you have to replace. On many occasions, it takes a lot of time. And also, you have to bin the previous fuse. It is not repairable or something like that. Also, another limitation is in terms of the time current characteristic curve or TCC curve. For a circuit breaker that has been equipped with protection relay, you have got a lot of curves like IDMT, like definite time DT, like the instantaneous, a lot of things like this. But the fuse has got only, each fuse has got only one curve. Therefore, it is not as flexible as the circuit breakers are, but especially when you have got distribution systems, that will be very good if you have got large and extensive usage of fuses and fuse switches. Other than that, that will cost you a lot of money actually to equip the system with all the circuit breakers and protection relays. And lastly, we have got the recloser switches, auto reclosers. So on many occasions when you have got a distribution feeder like that, and especially in the regional area, what happens is that, well, there are many um, factors that can cause a, a um, trip on the system, a fault on the system, but they are temporary. They are transient. Like, for example, on windy days, the three phases can touch each other. Or, for example, there could be branches of uh, let's say small branches of tree or something like that or things that are uh, floating in the air as a result of wind or something. So they, they can cause a very temporary short circuit, but it's all gone after that. But the result would be if you have got office stream, you have got a circuit breaker, a normal circuit breaker anyway. This circuit breaker will be tripped and as a result of that, all the customers that are connected all along the feeder, they will be affected and there will be an outage to all of them. So we are thinking of having a circuit breaker which is temporarily operating and tripping, but again, we would like it to get back, to reclose especially on this kind of feeders. And this is what we call a recloser. It can be an external recloser that you may have seen on top of wood poles or something, or it can be embedded on the circuit breaker that is inside the zone substation. It can be a single shot recloser, or it can be a multiple shot recloser. So what happens is that you have got a fault. This recloser operates and trips then it will wait like a timer. One second, two seconds, or three seconds, that depends on your settings. And then again close, reclose, as it says. If the fault is still there, and if it is a multiple shot recloser, it will trip again, again wait. After a few seconds, again it recloses. If the fault is there, again trip, wait for another few seconds, reclose. If the fault is still there, in that case, it will permanently trip the circuit. So this is how it works. And all I said is in here. So you can see that at the beginning, this is the instant of fault occurrence. It, it occurs, it will trip, it goes into open situation, and it waits for 
let's say just as an example one second and then it will reclose in here but the fault is still there so again it is stripped and it waits for another one second and then again it closes the circuit and see that hey again the fault is still there so again trips and another one second and then again if the fault is there the circuit breaker will be locked out and it will be permanently open until someone removes the fault and clears the fault and everyone everything gets back to normal so that timing of one second or three seconds or something it is in your hand it is your task actually to define for the recloser what is what should be that delay and it all goes back to the I squared T of the system the thermal capacity of the system that line conductor for example the cables how much heat they can tolerate at the fault current and within that time period so it says while reclosing is not a problem for vacuum and SF6 circuit breakers all circuit breakers have a very limited reclosing capability depending upon the fault level so that goes back to that fault capacity that goes back to that I squared T so that is one of the things that is one of the limitations that was improved and partly taken by the advent of SF6 and vacuum circuit breakers so a disadvantage of reclosing type circuit breakers is that where the controlled network comprises both overhead line and cable the supply to cable supplied customers will be adversely affected so as long as your feeder is totally overhead that's fine but where you have got cables actually to customers these cables can be disconnected on and off on and off on and off so this may not be good actually from the eyes of your customer and finally this is what we have got for vacuum interrupter in SF6 auto recloser so it is a circuit breaker but it has been equipped with auto reclosing feature again the main core of it is vacuum interrupter and it's been filled with SF6 gas so this is a very, very high advanced technology so it says maintenance is lower than oil field type and elastometric bushings are more resistant to damages compared to porcelain which was customary for the previous one control box normally situated at ground level and provides hundreds of reclosing operations so there is not such limitations since the protection system is microprocessor controlled these uh, reclosers provide many different reclosing programming scenarios and that's the end of this presentation today and I hope you have it